we're in a housing crisis, and I hope that's now abundantly clear to everyone in this chamber, as it has been abundantly clear to everyone in the community for quite some time now. Our party thinks that housing is a human right, and yet we are facing staggering numbers of people without a home. The rates of homelessness are skyrocketing. The rates of rent rises are skyrocketing. And as we've just heard from the previous speaker, young people have given up hope of ever being able to own a home. They're now struggling to pay the rent, let alone considering owning a home. So we are in a full-blown housing crisis. And we know that it's touching people that previously have not experienced such precariousness. We know that it's hurting single parents, women and children fleeing domestic violence, young people. It is touching so older people, people on an inadequate pension. This crisis is touching so many people. And it's against this backdrop that we have, I might add, a $39 billion yearly commitment to retain the tax perks that goes to property speculators and investors. $39 billion in just this current financial year that this government will continue to spend on people that have five, six, seven, 18 investment properties. Now, I'm flagging that we will come for you on that issue and we maintain that that is a very poor spend that is actually worsening the housing crisis and clearly deepening the inequality in, ha in housing. Uh, so it was against this backdrop that about nine months ago the government proposed the Housing Australia Future Fund bill, which we're now coming back to debate today. Now, the structure proposed by the government was not a direct spending on housing, like you would for schools or hospitals, but it was this complicated arrangement whereby a new body would gamble some money on the stock market, and if that gamble paid off and there were some profits, then some of that money, up to 500 million but not more, could be spent on housing. Well, what a sham, what a sham structure. It's exactly why the Greens said not only was this inadequate, but it was a poorly designed process for funding what is a fundamental human right, which is the right to have a roof over your head. And so we held out and we pushed for more. And we came under some fairly strong criticism uh, for doing that, not just from the people in this place, um, but there were others who were urging us to just pass this bill. Certainly the crossbench were saying, oh, just, this, is a, this is a good start, just get on with it. Well, fast forward nine months to yesterday, when the Greens were able to extract $3 billion in direct funding for social and affordable housing from this government as a result of our negotiations. Now that is tens of thousands of people that will now have a roof over their head that would not have otherwise got that were it not for us having strong negotiations and holding the line for as long as we did. So I want to commend uh, Greens leader Adam Bant MP and um, our housing spokesperson Max Chandler Mather MP from my home state of Queensland for driving what was a strong and powerful negotiation that has landed in a good place. We are proud that so many more people now will be able to have the benefit of a roof over their heads that otherwise would not have had we folded to the demands of some others that we simply waved through this inadequate piece of legislation. So we now have an additional $3 billion of direct funding to go to build social and affordable housing. Of course, $2 billion of that was announced with the Social um, Housing Accelerator a couple of months back, and then just yesterday a further $1 billion announced by the Prime Minister um, as a result of the negotiation with the Greens. Now, this is in addition, of course, to the uh, agreement to have a minimum spend from the Housing Australia Future Fund of $500 million. a minimum spend even if the gamble on the stock market doesn't pay off for you that year. So what we've really shown is that pressure works. We have secured an additional $3 billion for social and affordable homes, building thousands of homes for low-income renters, and we will now allow the half to pass through the Senate this sitting week. We always ask for two things. We ask for a decent amount of spend on social and affordable homes. We've secured that $3 billion. But we ask for action to protect renters. We have seen nationally rents increase by 24 per cent 
in the last 12 months. That is astronomical. And we are hearing so many anecdotes as we door knock through the legions of doors that we, um, uh, and people that we've spoken with in recent months. So many horror stories of people who might have been expecting a little bit of a, rate, uh, a rent increase, but are now being hit with hundreds of dollars of rent increases by their landlords and who are simply not, afford, not able to pay that increase. People are facing homelessness because of the profiteering of landlords, increasing rents beyond what they need to to cover costs, remembering that we subsidise them with them with negative gearing already. And this is making the homelessness crisis worse and it is increasing the waiting list for social housing, which is already uh, at 640,000 nationally and it's at least 50,000 in my home state of Queensland. So our policy settings have to date been making this problem worse and real people are suffering as a result. Unlimited rent rises should be illegal. And we push the government on this. And this has now become a national conversation. It's because so many people are feeling this in the real world. But never before has National Cabinet had to debate tenants' rights, rental rises. And we are proud to have ensured that National Cabinet the Prime Minister and all the Premiers and the Chief Ministers sat around the table and talked about who's got responsibility and what should be done to address the rental crisis. Now, unfortunately, whilst uh, the pressure engineered that meeting to occur, the results of that meeting were pretty flimsy. Many of the announcements that were made simply built upon what existing states and territories were doing, um, made some small tweaks, but we don't have a rent freeze nationally. We don't have rent caps. And we don't have um, a plan from the federal government to make unlimited rent rises illegal. Now, I've heard the government say in other contexts that when a crisis is a national one, it deserves national attention. It seems that they only say that selectively. What they've said with rents is basically it's not their problem. This is a state and territory matter. And yet you cannot have both things true at the same time. If on other matters you're saying the crisis is so great, deserves a national response, why are you not accepting that we are in a national rental crisis and that the federal government should do more? At the very least, you can incentivise the states. You can use that gentle pressure. It's wall-to-wall -wall Labor governments on the mainland. You're all on the same team. Don't tell me that the Prime Minister doesn't have any power to actually shape national policy and to coordinate and collaborate and incentivise the states and territories to stop unlimited rent rises, to make them illegal and to bring in some meaningful standards for tenants, not the wishy-washy commitment to running water that National Cabinet came out with. I mean, really, is that the level of expectation that renters can expect from this government, a commitment to running water? You would hope that it wouldn't require a National Cabinet meeting to guarantee running water for tenants. We need so much stronger standards for tenants. We need to investigate longer leases. We need to make those no-grounds evictions um, uh, nationwide and consistent. Wouldn't it be nice to have a right to a pet as a tenant? We know how good for mental health um, having an, an animal companion is. Wouldn't it be good if we could have some national standards relating to that? There is so much that the federal government could do to drive and to respond to the rental crisis that we are facing. And yet, nada, the most minimum outcome from the National Cabinet meeting. So I say to the government, we will keep pushing for a rent freeze. We will keep pushing to make unlimited rent rises illegal. And we do think it's your job as the federal government, particularly when all of the state and territory governments on the mainland are from your same political party, we do think it's your job to address this crisis. And moreover, people out there think it's your job to address this crisis. And people out there are actually really feeling the pain of the stratospheric uh, rent increases that they've faced in the last 12 months. And they know now, they know that there's someone in this parliament fighting for them. We have put renters' rights on the agenda nationally and we will keep fighting for an outcome. We were not able to get it this time around, but there's more legislation coming. And we have warned the government, and I'm doing so again today, that we will be using our power in this place to fight for renters. You should be doing the same. It shouldn't be a political issue. But someone's got to fight for renters. I would hope that you would all do that. But 
we're the ones pushing for it and until such time as you come to the party, then be warned, people are not happy and people expect better from you. They changed the government. They wanted a change of policy. They actually wanted their material concerns addressed and they're deeply disappointed and underwhelmed by what they've seen so far from this new government. So this is an invitation to the government to seriously consider those rental reforms that we are proposing, because it's actually what people deserve, it's what they want, and it's really a human rights issue. And in a wealthy country like ours, it is appalling that we can't see the opportunity here for the government of the day to help out one third of the population who rents. Now, I might add this is the same government that's spending, what is it, 500 billion now on nuclear submarines? It used to be 300 and something billion and we've got it recosted and it's half a trillion dollars now on nuclear submarines. You can find money for that. Stage three tax cuts, 300 and something billion now over 10 years. Again, you're not poor when it comes to those things, weapons of war and tax cuts for the rich. Oh, but you're too poor to do something about renters and too poor to actually put a decent amount of money in to build social and affordable homes in a way that would end the waiting list, in a way that would ensure that everyone in this wealthy country of ours can have a roof over their heads. We know the horror stories about people living in cars, people living in tents, people one rent rise away from that precarious situation. This is an eminently fixable issue and we again urge the government to get on with it and fix it and we warn you that we will not let up on this. The fight is just beginning and we have legions of people out there who are backing us on this and who deserve a better outcome from their government. Um, so it's with that that I move the second reading amendment that's just been circulated in my name in the chamber, which notes that Australia is in the middle of a rental crisis and that Labor had the power and the opportunity to freeze and cap rent increases through National Cabinet, but refused despite the fact that Labor holds government federally and in every state and territory on the mainland, and that the Senate agrees that every rent rise from here on out is Labor's fault, and that unlimited rent rises should be illegal, and calls on the federal Labor government to coordinate a two-year freeze on rent increases, followed by ongoing caps of 2 per cent through National Cabinet. That's amendment, uh, second reading amendment 2109, uh, standing in my name, which I moved. And I also flag that Senator Faruqi does not wish to proceed with her second reading amendment, so I seek leave to withdraw that on her behalf. Um, in the remaining uh, time allotted to me, um, I wanted to share, uh, if I have time, some of the horrific stories that we heard from renters through the Senate inquiry. Um, into the rental crisis, which the Greens were proud to spearhead and which been has been going around the country, giving a platform to people who felt voiceless until now and who felt like no one in here is representing them until they heard the Greens were fighting for them. Um, I, I probably don't have time to share the full testimony, but in Brisbane, in my home state of Queensland, the Anjan, as it's also known, a lady called Jo gave evidence to the Senate inquiry and she says, I grew up in a family violence situation alongside my sister. We sought help from the police, Centrelink and our university, but we didn't receive protection. Our abuser completely controlled our lives financially, emotionally and physically well into our 20s. In 2022, I fled Queensland when he threatened to kill me. I just achieved a first-class honours degree. I'm not telling you this because I want you to feel sorry for me, but I do need you to understand that the experience is accompanied by a raft of financial penalties from taking out a hex loan, which enabled us to lessen the impact of the financial abuse, to routinely paying for treatment for complex post-traumatic stress disorder and physical injuries. This situation has cost me far more than the deposit on a home. Over time, the financial burden has accumulated, not least because I'm beholden to a housing market that unfairly prioritises investors. The abuse that I've managed for most of my life only ended last year, um, uh, and she goes on um, and tells the story of financial abuse and manipulation. Um, Joe was just one of the submitters to that inquiry. There were many in um, Brisbane. There were many around the country. These are real people. They expect action on the rental crisis and they expect a government to deliver on uh, making unlimited rent rises illegal. And that's what the Greens will continue to push to achieve. Authorised by Elle Waters, Australian Greens, Canberra.